holy, it's perfect, and it's eternal. And so the psalmist says, Lord, in your word I put my hope. How many of you are putting your hope in God's word too? Yes. The promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. They are they are yes towards you. And so the, the Bible tells us that we inherit the promises of God with faith and with patience. By faith, by believing in, and patience, persevering in our faith. We inherit the promises of God. Okay? So just like the psalmist, we put our hope in God's word. Then he says, my soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. There is this eager pursuit of God. There is this seeking after the face of God. That we come and join the psalmist here as well. That we are here seeking God. God, I'm waiting on you. I'm seeking you. I'm, I'm searching for you. I want you. I want your presence in my life. How many of you can echo that heart cry as well? And then the psalmist finishes with two more verses. It says, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. And with Him is full redemption. He Himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And I love this. With Him is full redemption. In the, in the, in the footnotes of my Bible, I have a study Bible. And in the footnotes on the last phrase where it says, He Himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. It says this, from all their sins, from the root of trouble, but also from all its consequences. This greatest of all hopes has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? And so my faith today is that God uh, is going to fully redeem me and fully redeem you from all of our sins, not just the power of sin, but the consequences of our sin. So there is not just freedom from sin, but there's forgiveness of our sin. Amen. And God is here to complete His full redemption in you and in me. Can you get excited about that? That's you, that's me. So I would like you to stand this morning and hope some of those words encourage you. Kind of get your mind set on seeking God this morning. On being thankful for who He is. That He keeps no record of wrongs. That there's forgiveness in God. And that He has come to give us full redemption. And just like the psalmist, we are here to seek God. We're here to seek His presence. And to, and to reach out and, and connect with the giver of life. The sustainer of life. The author of life. The one who began and the one who's going to finish His good work in each and every one of us. So we lift our hands to heaven. Let's just do that together. Lord, we look to you today as the giver of life. And uh, Lord, we are here to interact with you, encounter you. We're here to seek you. We long for you and all that you have for us today. We thank you, Lord. We celebrate that you have forgiven us of our sins through faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank that you are redeeming us, fully redeeming us today. And so we look for you, Lord, to continue your good work in us today. As we've gathered together today as the people of God, Lord, as we have come to meet with you this sacred day, this holy appointment, we thank you, Lord, that you are here, that your presence is here to lift us, to encourage us, to build us, to teach us, to inspire us, to fill us with your life. And so, Lord, we are your people, and you are our God, and we declare today that this is the day that you have made, and we choose to rejoice and be glad in it as we celebrate this great and awesome salvation that is continuing to work itself out in our lives each and every day. And, Lord, we pray. We pray for our community. We pray for our nation that your spirit will come and, and that you will cause our country and our community to turn to you, yes. to turn to life, to receive life, life to the full today. And as all of your people around this nation and around this world are gathering together to lift up your name, let, let the, the voices of the earth give glory and praise yes. to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let the people of God rise up today Hallelujah. and experience the life that you have for us. Jesus. May we place our hope in you today, God, yes. not in any other human effort or means, but, Lord, that we would put our trust and hope in you and you alone today. Yes. Let the voices of the children of God rise across this earth today, giving you praise and glory. Praise and glory. That is who you are. You're the King of glory, the great I Am, the everlasting God. And, Lord, our voices will sing. Our voices will rise 
with thankful hearts, grateful hearts today, recognizing who you are. And we give you praise and we give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship him. Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning?
just a fresh new this morning our living inheritance that is in Christ Jesus and so uh, if you could just take the elements and uh, hold on to those uh, we're gonna sing this uh, chorus again or once or twice they'll come back up and then we will we will take together
chapter 22 and Jesus is having the last supper with his disciples he said uh, this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me and later he also said this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you and and uh, I was looking up this this word in a study about remembrance or remember and uh, I printed off some of my study notes to encourage you with these words. It says the Hebrew Bible, to forget someone uh, is much more serious. To forget someone is to annihilate that person or obliterate him or destroy him. But when the Israelites cried to God not to forget them, they didn't mean be sure to think of us once in a while. They meant don't annihilate us, don't blot us out. It's obvious that to forget in Hebrew has to do not with ideas, but with living realities. In the same manner, to remember has to do not with recollecting notions, but with the living realities. In a word, to remember Hebraically is to bring a past event up into the present so that what happened back then continues to happen right now and is therefore the operative reality of our existence. When unfolded back then, altering forever those whom it touched then, continues to be operative now. Altering yes. forever yes. those who remember it now. Yes. When the Israelites are urged to remember the deliverance from slavery of their four, four parents centuries earlier, they aren't being urged merely to recollect a historical fact. Rather, they are being urged to live the same reality themselves. The reality of deliverance yeah. several hundred years later. Yeah. And so today, when we hear the words of Jesus, yeah. and Hebraically, He is saying to you and to me, do this in remembrance of me. Yeah. What is He saying? He's not saying, just remember the fact that I died, and then I rose again, and I was beaten, and I did this, I did that. He is saying, to embody the living reality of what he did then is to be alive in you and me now. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? To remember. To remember is not to recollect the idea, but it is to experience the reality. To experience the reality. And so today, as we just sing this song, holy, holy, there is no one worthy except Jesus. He is the one who has purchased for you and for me forgiveness of our sins, deliverance of sickness and disease, deliverance from the power of the devil over our lives. He has called us out of the kingdom of darkness into yeah. the kingdom of light. And he's calling us today to remember that, to experience that living reality. Are you ready to experience the living reality of your salvation today? And so let's just receive it. And so Jesus, we thank you that today you are the living bread. You're not the dead bread. You're the living bread. And you are the living water. You're not the dead water. You're the living water that gives us life, that satisfies our soul, that sets us free. You are the Prince of Peace. You are the captain of the host. You are the Alpha, the Omega. You're the beginning, the end. You are the great I Am. You are everything to us. And you are a great shepherd who laid his life down for us, your sheep, that we might have life and have it to the full. And today, Lord, we enter into the living inheritance, into the living reality right now of our sins being forgiven and all of our sins being washed away by, because we've placed our faith in you. Right now, we, we don't understand all the attacks physically against our bodies, the weaknesses that we experience from time to time. But Lord, by faith, we just declare that we are made whole yeah. through the stripes on your back yeah. and we receive divine health and wholeness into these bodies Lord. into these minds in the name of Jesus yeah. thank you Lord thank you Lord that you've empowered us and set us free from all the chains of bondage all the chains of addiction all the chains of darkness that you have grafted us in that we are filled with life that we are full with the lights of God so Lord we receive right now the living reality that is only found in you Jesus and in the name, in your name, the name above all other names, we receive by faith 
all of these wonderful gifts, the gift of salvation you have given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take together. Now let's just say this prayer together. Would you just be so bold as to repeat this prayer and say say this with me? Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a prayer not asking, it's a prayer of declaration for the promises of God. And so let's just say this together. Say, mine, mine. you are now under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I have the mind of Christ. And heart, you are whole in the name of Jesus Christ. Receive peace. Receive comfort. Receive wholeness. And body, be quickened with the life of God right now in the name of Jesus. Every cell, respond unto life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Unconscious, be cleansed of guilt and shame. Your sins have been washed away, and you are now free. Lord, we receive all of this in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just celebrate. Thank you, Lord. Just so you don't have to worry about throwing these away, just kind of pass them down. And then on the right side of your aisle, the chair in front of you has a little holder. You can stack all those cups in there. You don't mind helping each other, pass those down. And we just continue to just enjoy the presence of God for a few more songs and worship together. Let's just enjoy His presence this morning.
the prayer team that will receive uh, your prayer prayer requests by tomorrow afternoon at the latest, and the, and they will be reading those and praying for you and just encouraging you um, in prayer. So if you ever have any prayer requests or if you have some prayer reports each week when you come in in your folder, there's always a card there, and you can just kind of take your own time uh, before the service or while you're uh, preparing to give and write write down those prayer requests or praise reports. And then we, we collect them and we get them back out to a team of people who pray for you throughout this week. I just think prayer is just way underrated. And we need to be a praying people. We just need to bind and loose. The, the, uh, Jesus said, that I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind uh, you know, on earth, you bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, you loose in heaven. And that, that, that means that we get to do business in the heavenly realm and bringing in the kingdom of God to bear upon our, our realities. That's prayer. So whatever whatever God's will is, Jesus said, pray that His will uh, will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So that's prayer. That's us going into the will of God and pulling it into our reality. So we need to be pray uh, praying people, right? So we, we want to continue to encourage each other to pray. And if you have a gift to give, you can bring that forward or, or get that prepared as the ushers come forward. And I, I want to lead us in prayer this morning uh, just as we give. And th that God would just continue to bless our church so that we can continue to be a great blessing to um, this community and all the things that God puts in our heart to do. Lord, we just thank you that you are our provider. And we thank you, Lord, that as we look to you, we trust in you, that you will meet all the needs that we have. And as we just continue to have your heart uh, just in, implanted into us, you cause us to have this great desire uh, to give and to be generous and to make a difference with, with the resources you've blessed us with. And so, Lord, as we give today, we just right now, we are not just giving out a routine, but we are giving in faith right now, trusting that you will meet all of our needs, but also believing that we are investing in eternity and that lives are going to be changed forever because of the kingdom of God's work will just grow and advance in this, in this area through this ministry. And Lord, may you cause all of us that have anything to do with these decisions, Lord, to, to have your wisdom, that we will follow your heart, that we will, we will put your resources into your activities so that we will see your results. And we will see many lives changed in the name of Jesus. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. 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 Um, also, as, uh, as the ushers are doing that, we have a uh, special dedication today. And uh, we have a baby dedication. And I'm, I would like to invite up here uh, James and Kelly Kinney and their, their baby, Juliet, uh, wherever you guys are. Right back here. Yeah, okay. And Grandma Brenda. <laughs> oh, yeah. You guys can make your way up here. When I, I'll meet you down here. Come on over here, guys, on the lights so we can see you guys. Oh, we're looking to join the show here. Juliet Kenny, and, and uh, this is Grandma, and Grandma is going to pray uh, for her grandbaby, and then, then uh, I'm going to I'm going to bless and dedicate uh, Juliet, and actually, my dedicating her today to raising her in the ways of the Lord as we do baby dedications around here. You know, it, uh, God says that our children are a blessing, and they're like arrows in the hand of a warrior. And we always view our children as um, our responsibility to shoot them as an arrow into the target that God has for them. And that's what baby dedications are. That we're dedicating ourselves to that process. Sharpening our children and uh, as a group and as family to, to play our part in just sharpening and nurturing and Thank teaching and training. And uh, so that each one of our children can hit the target God has created them for. So... We're all oohing and on here. <laughs> yeah. So, Grandma, would you kind of lead us in prayer and then we'll dedicate to you? Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord. 
Thank you for the blessing that you have sent to us in Juliet Rose. Thank you, Lord, for a family that is dedicating themselves to her to help her find a personal relationship with you. We just pray, Lord, that uh, your will be done in her life and that she become the lighthouse on earth here, shining your love, being the beacon for others, Lord, that you would have her to be. Thank you, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want to bless you, okay? All right. Now, Juliet, the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Lord. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. you guys to remember this special day. And God bless you guys and God continue to be all of us in you. She might that might be her her thing, huh? She might want to that mic so she can start <laughs> preaching someday. Awesome. Hey, um, today I wanted to kind of, I, I'm really actually a little nervous about uh, sharing with you today because this is such an atypical uh, message that I, I feel that I have to bring that God has been stirring me. And I, I kind of started it a little bit last week and um, it's just, you just need to bear with me because nor normally I love to teach. I love to teach you know, God's Word and principles that help us and, and bring, you know, truth and, and enlightenment to us. Um, and, but God has just really put something on me to share with you the last couple of weeks, last week and today, that's different. It's a little bit more preachy, you know, and, uh, and it's also, uh, my, my concern is that it would not come across as a, as a, a frustration or as a, um, anything other than just what God has been birthing in my heart. And I think he's given me, a, uh, what he's doing is, uh, I think he's birthing in me a compassion for our country and, uh, and a compassion for, for people. And, and so there's some things I want to share with you today that's, uh, you know, just different for me. So are you guys ready? And, uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to give you a couple of updates on some, some family business because uh, we've been pursuing and, and praying about and thinking about um, a, an opportunity here in our community. Uh, the Montrose Bowling Alley has been for sale. It's been for auction. Uh, the auction didn't meet uh, its minimum bid. So then I was in contact with the owners, uh, the bank that owns it, and, and just kind of talking it about what the possibilities might be if we are interested in purchasing it. And uh, I know that not all of you know all of those details, but some of you know enough that I, I felt obligated to kind of give you a little bit of an update on kind of what's been going on. So behind the scenes, we've been praying and talking as elders and leaders and staff and just trying to sort out, is, is this something that God would have us do uh, to purchase this building, uh, to per pursue like a youth center? Uh, because our heart and, and part of our vision as a church is to have a youth center someday. And so when this opportunity came up, I didn't know if this was God's timing or not. So I just want to give you an update. I don't have any grand, spectacular news for you, okay? But I see everybody leaning forward like, <laughs> But um, I do want to say that, you know, as we, as we make decisions uh, in the church and as we seek to make decisions as individuals for our own lives, you know, there is a process that God would have us go through. And certainly, one of the biggest things that I rely on is peace. It's one of the biggest 
uh, components that I have got to have and, and as elders we need to have and as, as, a, as a family, my wife and I, we need to have before we move forward with a decision, a major decision. We have to have peace. You know what I mean? We have to be settled. We can't have that little cramp in the stomach, that little uh, something there that like, and, and I have, I have uh, personally, I've violated that peace before. Every time I violated that peace in my history, in my personal decisions, uh, it hasn't worked out very good for me. You know, I don't know if you've ever felt pressured to make a decision, and maybe there's a timeline, and maybe there's, you know, an immediacy, and it had to be decided right now, and so you, you didn't quite feel like you're right, but you, you just felt like you had to do it, and you did it, and then later maybe it didn't work out very well. So that's the kind of thing that I've experienced in my, in my personal walk, too, is peace. I've got to have the peace of God moving forward. So anyway, with the, with the bowling alley, I just want to um, mention to you briefly that uh, at this point, we are not trying to chase that, okay? Uh, and so we are, we're not putting any offers on the building. Uh, there's been some concerns about the building itself. I've talked to different people. There's been some concerns about my personal time and availability to head up this project at this point in our church and the development of our church. We really feel that while the vision is red hot, or I don't know if red hot's a good phrase, white hot maybe, <laughs> white hot, yeah. Our vision is for the youth, youth and for the community, it's there, it's there. So I don't even see that the building itself is about uh, uh, changing a direction or not. The vision is there, and we're going to continue to move in the vision that God has, ha has for our church to impact this community. And that really is going to involve a, a youth center someday. But we don't feel at this point with the counsel that I've received from the elders that we should chase this right now. There's just some concerns that we have about the, the, the amount of time. Me, personally, uh, we need to raise up more leaders in our church. Our church is on the brink of going to two services, as you know. And uh, we need to continue to grow and just rise, raise up more of us leaders uh, to carry different parts of the ministry so that we can continue to expand. And if we spread ourselves out too thin too quickly, uh, we, you know, I, we just, it doesn't work. You know, we, we tire out or burn out or get discouraged. Um, and so at this point, I don't know what's going to happen in that bowling alley, okay? But what we're going to do is when Amy and I, we get to go to Israel tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, exciting. So when we get back to Israel, part of my plan is to begin to uh, move forward in our vision uh, for the community and begin to have some serious conversations with key leaders in our community and begin to develop a team for this vision of having a youth community center. And so as I do that, and if God brings those pieces together, as that goes, so will go that vision in, in terms of the timeline of that. And who knows, maybe in three months we'll, be in a, we'll have a whole team of people and we'll have everything ready to go and, we'll, and the bowling alley will still, still be available and we'll have a green light. Or maybe not. Maybe uh, maybe somebody here uh, is going to say, you know, I'm, I'm all on board with this and here's a million dollars to build a brand new facility that don't have any new things or, or any, you know, whatever. So who knows what God's going to do. But what we do need is we do need the support of the entire community. And I believe that we are going to have that the people that I've been talking with are very excited and see a great need for us to come together as a community to, to do something like this for our kids. Isn't that exciting? This is a real exciting time to be alive in Montrose, Michigan. I tell you, it's cool. And so, um, anyway, that's kind of a quick update at this point. Uh, we're not chasing after it, but what we are going to do is we're going to keep moving forward in building uh, our vision for that for the future. However long that takes, there is no timeline. But the, the umpire, the Bible says the umpire is peace. Okay, that's the umpire. That's the one who calls the shot, is the peace of, of God in our lives. And so I don't ever want to, because I have, I don't want to step out of that peace, because I have, I have done that before. And it's just, whew, it's a lot of work. Okay, because when you step out of God's plan, and now it's all on you, man, that's a heavy, heavy load to bear. And I, I, I can't bear it. I just haven't been able to bear it in the past. And so I don't want to step out of this peace. So let's continue to praise the church, that God will continue to lead us, 
if it's a bowling alley or not, or if it's a brand new building in the future, or we need to blow this wall yeah. out, or whatever we need to do, we'll do it. But we're going to do it in Him, and when we do it in Him, He will provide everything that we need. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, so that's kind of where we're at. I'm still real excited. And I'm excited about the idea itself because I think it stirred up in us just a, a fresh passion for, yeah, what we're doing here matters. And yeah, we're not done by any means. We're just getting started. Yeah. And so as I've talked with many of you, I've seen a real excitement for this idea. I haven't had anybody not excited about the idea. It's just the timing and some of the circumstances is what has held us back. We just haven't had peace about this specific <laughs> step to take, okay? So that, that's pretty cool. The other thing I wanted to give you a quick update on is on March 17th, we're going to two services. And last week I explained why, and uh, basically the bottom line is we, we don't have any parking places left, we don't have any children's space left, and we don't have any seats left. And if we go to two services, we don't need any money, we don't need to wait to have anything built, right? And all we need, we got everything we need, except, well, we got everything we need. All we need is people, and we got the people. So isn't this exciting? Yeah. So we're, at this point, you know, we're not going to try to take on a big building project. We're not going to try to stress ourselves out by, you know, squeezing money out of places that we don't have it to do to do something like that. I would love, I would love to blow this wall out. I think that'd be awesome. I'd love to have everybody in one service and have four or five hundred of us all gathered together. I I love that. Okay, but I also love people. And if we don't have any more room for people, and we don't have a couple million dollars sitting around, then we need to go to two services, right? So, so that's why we're going to two services. But um, last week, I just want to give you a, a really encouraging report. For those who are here, I asked you to consider to sign up or to commit to uh, serving. Uh, many of us are going to attend one service and serve in another service because that's what we do. What else are you going to do? Go home and watch TV? Come and come on. You can be in the house of the Lord, loving people and loving God. And so, um, to me, that, that's, that's just a, a no-brainer. But anyway, I want to give you just real, real encouraging news. We had eight people last week sign up for our nursery. Wow. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So we're going to have, I'm pretty confident we will have a full nursery already for our first service uh, and second service. Um, we also had eight People sign up to help with our energy zone, our children's ministry. Eight more helpers there. And seven more greeters and two ushers. And then uh, the School of Choice. I also was talking about the School of Choice here in Montrose. Uh, we have this great partnership going on right now where the school is allowing us to come in every other Wednesday, talk to the kids about life principles. And, uh, and of course, I'm inserting God into that because that is the real answer. Jesus is the answer, okay? So we're not talking about religion. We're talking about life. We're talking about life. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the answer. Come on, get excited. He's the answer. So we're just bringing the answer. We're bringing the answer uh, every other Wednesday to our kids. And anyway, some of you... Uh, a lot of you are interested in helping out. Now, if you're here and you signed up and I, I did not get a hold of you yet, I didn't. Um, but here's what I want to say. is um, As we continue to build this program and as I continue to meet with the staff and the teachers, then I'm going to be tapping your shoulder. But I can't put all of you to work right away because it's a process. Last week and this week, I've just been trying to find out, hey, who's out there? Is there any support for this? Um, if I get support, then I can go to the staff, then I can go to the kids and say, hey, you need a big brother, you need a big sister. Hey, I'm going to find someone that will, that, that will fit well with you, you see? And so that's what I did. So if you signed up, and I didn't con connect with you yet. I apologize, but um, I haven't connected with you personally. But check this out. 18 of you wow. signed up to be a personal mentor of one of these students. Isn't that awesome? And uh, 15 prayer partners and seven lunch monitors. And so I need to get back with all of you on that list. Uh, but again, it's not something that immediately necessarily we're going to be able to do because I've got to kind of find the students one at a time, find out who's really interested in this. And over these next several weeks and months, we're going to, we're, I'm, going to, I'm going to be coming back to you and we're going to be building this program as we go. I just want to commend you. I thought that was a tremendous 
a tremendous heart response last week. And, uh, and this week, do we have those cards in the, in the bulletin this week too or not? We don't? Okay. What? We got an Easter card though. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so, yeah, well, our Easter card, if you see that in there, um, that's just another opportunity to, to serve. Yes. What is? Okay, so the other two cards that we had last week, if you weren't here, this is a really big deal, okay? Because I feel like it's time. It's time for our church to, to go to two services. We need to if we're going to reach anybody else. We just need to, okay? But it's not just a need to. It's a want to. Because it's our opportunity to expand our love to this community and to reach out to more people. And so I really want to urge you to consider to volunteer, to be a part of one of those services and uh, or if you want to be a part of our, our school of choice opportunities like I just mentioned the two cards are at our guest service counter you can take one of those cards just fill it out and you can turn it in uh, to the guest services and, and uh, again we'll get back with you on that today we also have an Easter card out there so you can look, check into that if you want to help for our Easter event coming up soon so all kinds of opportunities to sign up um, so our goal is to to double our children's ministry. And one of the concerns that I've heard this last week uh, was that we don't feel like we can start both services with all of our children's ministry staff doing both. We don't have enough to do that yet, but we might, who knows, how fast people come together and, and participate and help make that happen. So the, the idea is that the first service at 9 o'clock Okay, is not going to have the children's ministry program, but we will have a nursery because we just had a great response last week already. So we're going to have enough nursery to have a nursery for the little ones. We won't have a full-fledged children's ministry though, as of right now. Okay, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to see who is willing to serve. So if we get enough, we will as soon as we do. My goal is that by the fall, we're totally full and ready to crank out full identical services for the children in both services. Okay? But that's up to God. God said He would provide for us. And if God's speaking to your heart to get involved, it's not as scary as you think. In fact, everybody who tells me they're involved, they can't believe what goes on back there. In fact, they believe that that's what's really going on. And we're, I'm babysitting you guys. Because all the action going on back there with our kids. And it's very organized. It's very easy to participate and be a helper. But, uh, you know, my heart is that, God, would you, would you bring to us and would you raise up and would you call out all that we need to do what you're calling us to do? Because the, the, Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would, he would raise up more laborers into the harvest field. And we've got a harvest field. And uh, so I just pray, if God's touching your heart, please. Just respond, sign up, get involved, because uh, we would love to have two full children's ministry services, 9 o'clock and 11. So here's the deal. The services right now run a little bit longer than what we anticipate they will be in the, in the 9 and the 11 o'clock, okay? We're just, we need to just kind of tidy it up a little bit. So if you're concerned about coming to the 11 o'clock and getting out really late, uh, my, my commitment to you is that that service will be done from 11, it'll be done at 12.30. Okay, 12.25 or 12.30. It will be about 85 minutes, 90. Right now our services run uh, about two hours. <laughs> because we only have one and uh, you know. What else are you going to do? <laughs> so, but uh, I just wanted to alleviate some of your concerns because I've heard that concern from parents with children uh, coming at 11 and they're concerned that it would just go way too long for them but it will be done by 12.25, 12.30 for that second service, okay? And as soon as we can, we'll offer the full children's ministry for the 9 o'clock as well. Does that sound good? I mean, I'm just being honest and real with you. you know, that's where we're at. And uh, I really hope that uh, you have a heart to, to catch what God is doing. Uh, now going back to kind of um, our topic of today. And last week, the, the topic was it's time. It's time. There's a scripture in Chronicles um, that says that uh, the men of Issachar, this is First Chronicles 12.32, I mentioned this last week. In the middle of Chronicles, this statement, men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do, 
They understood their times and they knew what Israel should do. And uh, my message last week and continues today is that we are living in a time that we need to realize what's going on and we need to realize what we ought to do. Israel is is Israel, but it also in the scriptures also includes and refers to at times just the people of God. The people of God. That's you and that's me. We are the people of God, right? We are called by His name. Called out of the darkness, the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light. We are Israel. We are part of Israel. We're part of the people of God. And we are born for such a time as this. And I'll tell you, I've never been so stirred by world events ever in my lifetime. And I don't say this lightly at all because I don't even like, I don't even like, I don't even like it when people say this. Uh, it's just me. But, but uh, I have never in my lifetime felt more likely that Jesus is going to come back than I do now. And I'm not making any predictions. I mean, I don't know. Jesus doesn't know when he's coming again. But I'm telling you, everything that I'm hearing, everything that I'm learning, all the other teachers and preachers that I'm hearing from, there is just a stirring in our world right now. And there is a very strong conviction that we could be living in the last days. And I don't, I don't know if you feel that. I, I'm just telling you, me personally, I've never felt it more ever in my life than I do now. And I, and I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it will happen in our lifetime. Maybe not. But I, at least I know that I'm feeling it. And it's causing me to think differently. And to live differently. And I think that's a good thing. I think God wants us to live like any day He could be coming back. I think we live differently when we think that way. And we're feeling that way. And I just wanted to talk, touch base a little bit on our country as a nation. And so today, just, we're just kind of entitling this One Nation Under God. And I want to remind us today that, that we are a nation that has been founded under God. And I want to encourage you with some, some history. Okay, I've been doing a lot of reading and stuff. And I just kind of want to take you on a little journey real quick of some historical facts about our country and how it relates to one nation under God. Okay, you guys ready? Yeah. Check this out. This really, this is just a little sliver, just a little slice of, of all the information that's out there. But in, uh, in 1620, there was something called the Mayfair Compact. And it was written by William Bradford before they got off this boat and they were, they were uh, coming to be the first settlement in Virginia. We have Jamestown and we have Plymouth. Okay, and those are the two real key early settlements in our country. Well, this one is the Plymouth. This this one is the one in Virginia. And before they got off the boat, they thought, man, we, we need to write something down so that we can kind of hold all this together and just put something together. So this is what the Mayfair Compact is. Okay, this is one of the first settlements in our country. And I want to read for you a part of that compact. Okay, it's in your notes so you can have it for yourself later. But here's William Bradford writing these words, and he says this. Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Isn't that cool? For the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith, and the honor of our king and country. Do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In other words, we are going to make a covenant with God, a covenant with one another, and this is for His glory, this is for the advancement of, the, of, of our Christian faith, and this is why we are here to establish this colony. Ooh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So that was the purpose of 
our initial settlement. Then uh, another key part of history was the first Continental Congress prayer. First Continental Congress came together. This is just before the Declaration of Independence. These men were meeting together. They were trying to figure out if it was time to break from the British uh, rule, if it was time to revolt. They had been trying to work out agreements. They had been trying for years to, to try to settle their differences without having to uh, be an independent body. Uh, this is in 1774. This is before they finally made that commitment in 1776. But they were meeting, and this is the first Continental Congress on September 7th, the first meeting of these people. In 1774, they decided to have a prayer. The first prayer of the first Continental Congress. And I want to read it for you. Okay? They, they, they asked this gentleman, Mr. Jacob Duche, an Episcopal clergy. He read Psalm 35, verses 1 through 6, and verses 9 through 10. And it was a powerful moment because in this moment, while they were meeting, they had a report that morning that there was a great slaughter taking place in Boston and that the British government was, uh, well, the troops were advancing and were starting to move and they were really concerned and here they are meeting and now there's all this tension and, uh, and this, this, this pastor, this clergy, he read these scriptures that were prophetic if you read them on your own and it, it just swept through this continental congress Great, it brought a great presence of God. Men were dropping to their knees and they were, they were just calling out on God and there's a presence of God in this room. And then this man got up and prayed and he prayed this prayer and it was a little bit more of a spontaneous prayer than what in the culture of the day they, anyone anticipated. They didn't anticipate this. It was a normal behavior in these official settings for someone to spontaneously pray a prayer. It was usually a lot more formal than this. And yet he prayed this prayer, and I want to read it for you. He said, Be thou present, O God of wisdom, and direct the counsel of this honorable assembly. Enable them to settle all things on the best and surest foundations, that the scene of blood may be speedily closed, that order, harmony, and peace may be effectually restored, and that truth and justice, religion and piety prevail and flourish among the people. Preserve the health of their bodies and the vigor of their minds. Shower down on them and the millions they here represent such temporal blessings as thou seest expedient for them in this world and crown them with everlasting glory in the world to come. All this we ask in the name and through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son and our Savior. Amen. Amen. The first prayer of the First Continental Congress. Again, in the name of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Asking for wisdom, direction, that God would bless our country, that God would lead these men. And after that prayer and after those scripture readings, they received a second report that the first report was false. And they, they rejoiced and, and felt that God had answered their prayers. Now, um, George Washington, the first inauguration, and you know the Declaration of Independence was in 1776, but the actual government of the United States was not officially formed and functioning until the first presidential inauguration, which was years later, in April 30th of 1789. This was the inauguration of George Washington, our first president. And I have a copy of his inaugural address here, which was at the, the capital then of our country, was in New York City. And uh, I have a copy of his, of his speech. And I want to just read a couple of excerpts of the first inaugural presidential acceptance speech, okay, in our history of our country. He said this, it would be particularly improper to admit in this first official act, my fervent supplications to that almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect. And he goes on. He talks about God as almighty being, as the great author. Then he says this, No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand that means God, which conducts the affairs of men more than those of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation 
seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. Washington is giving credit for everything that had brought our country to that place and that point in time to God. He's like, there's no other people on the face of the earth that, that owe credit to God more than the United States of America for becoming who we are at this present day. You with me on that? Uh, later in the speech, he goes on to say, there exists in the economy and course of nature an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness, between duty and advantage, between the genuine maxims of an honest and magnanimous policy and the solid rewards of public prosperity and felicity. Since we ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. What is he saying? I know this is old, old and very distinguished language. He's saying that we cannot expect the favor of God, the smiles of heaven, if we are not obeying and following the order of heaven, the ways of heaven, the ways of God. And so he's warning our country that what has brought us to this place of independence and freedom and, and what will keep us in this place of independence and freedom and prosperity will be our continued acknowledgement that as we live according to God's ways, we will continue to enjoy the favor and the blessings of God. That's what he's saying. And he goes on to finish his speech by saying, I shall take my present leave, but not without resorting once more to the benign parent of the human race in humble supplication that since he has been pleased to favor the American people with opportunities for deliberating in perfect tranquility and dispositions for deciding with unparalleled unanimity on a form of government, the security of their union and the advancement of their happiness, so his divine blessing may be equally conspicuous in the enlarged views, the temperate consultations, and the wise measures on which the success of this government must depend. He is asking that the same uh, views that have brought us there of God and of His providence and of His favor and His blessings will continue to motivate and infiltrate the decisions of our government in the years to come. That's what he's saying. Isn't that beautiful? First President of the United States. Dedicating, acknowledging God's, God's hand in our country. Now, after they did this, then um, uh, three days before the inauguration, the first inauguration, there was the first official act of our government was going to take place. The Continental Congress had met. They made this decision three days before the presidential inauguration. I'm going to tell you what that decision is in a second. Then we had the presidential inauguration, and then we did what the Continental Congress said we should do after the inauguration. Okay, this is what they declared three days before, an official act of, of, the, of the Congress. It says that they passed the following resolution. Resolved that after the oath shall have been administered to the President, he, attended by the Vice President and members of the Senate and House of Representatives, shall proceed to St. Paul's Chapel to hear divine service. What does that mean? It means we are going to, as the first official act of our government, after the president is sworn in, we are going to walk down the street to St. Paul's Chapel, and we are going to have a worship service. Do you realize that? The first official act of our government was to worship God. Wow. This is history. You can just, you, this is history. This is a something that we're making up here. So it says, The Right Reverend Samuel Provost, newly appointed chaplain of the United States Senate and First Episcopal Bishop of New York, performed divine service at St. Paul's Chapel on April 30th, 1789, immediately following Washington's inauguration. You can still see this, uh, this church. It's the... Um, <laughs> those of you who've read The Harbinger are all like, oh yeah, oh yeah. There's a book out there you might want to read. It's called The Harbinger by Jonathan Kahn. Uh, but this church is still in existence today. In fact, uh, during the 9-11, it's on the grounds of 
uh, of ground zero, and, uh, and it's still there today, and it served as a great refuge during those hundreds of days following that tragedy, and they began to post on the grit, the, the raw iron uh, fence around there, all the pictures of the people, and it became kind of the main focus, focal point during that tragedy of people trying to find their loved ones, people would come there for prayer. It was just a nonstop ministry going on at this church. There's a lot more to that uh, than we have time to talk about, but that's a whole different story. If you want to read a great book called The Harbinger, I would recommend it. But our foundation is on God. Here's a couple other facts that, that kind of confirm this. Supreme Court's daily prayer. Every day the Supreme Court starts with one official invoking the protection of God, and they say, God save the United States and this honorable court. Every day that they meet. The Senate and the House both have a prayer opening their daily sessions. At each presidential inauguration since the beginning of our country, the President of the United States says these words at the end. So help me God. So help me God. Since 1865, we have had the words, In God We Trust, stamped on our coins. And our Star Spangled Banner, which by an official act of Congress in 1931 was adopted as our national anthem, has four verses. We only sing usually one verse, but one of the verses, I don't know, I think it's verse three or four, I'm not sure which one, I, I can't remember, I looked it up, has this, th these words, this is the verse. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven-rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. This is our national anthem, and it was adopted by Congress in 1931. In 1952, Congress enacted legislation calling upon the president each year to proclaim a national day of prayer. And in 1954, Congress added a phrase to the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And it's this phrase, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. One nation under God. Official Act of Congress added that in 1954. And so here's our foundation, and trust me, this is a little tiny sliver of quotes and of men and of decisions and women and other famous people that have dedicated and continue to build on this great foundation of faith. Do you Are you excited that our, our, our foundation is on God? And from the very beginning, from the very beginning, in fact, I just heard a message yesterday by John Hagee who was talking about something amazing in 1492 when, when there was a edict against all the Jews in Spain uh, and they were kicked out of Spain. They had 14 days to get out of Spain. He said, and I haven't had time to verify this, but I trust him. He said that the Jews um, uh, were lost their property and lost everything. Um, but what they did is they gathered together and they sponsored another Jew by the name of Christopher Columbus. And their, their effort was to find a place to go to be able to worship God. And in 1492, uh, when they were kicked out of Spain, they helped that happen, and they found a place to worship God. I haven't had time to verify that, but I, I know 1492 is a pretty strong day. I know that part's true. I also know that 1492, which is a message I want to share with you maybe in a, in a month or so, possibly, there were four blood red moons that year, and there was a solar eclipse, and uh, I'm going to tell you the significance of those down the road because we have them coming in 2014 and 2015 and they're going to land on the Jewish holidays of Passover, Sukkot, Nisan which is the, the day that the Israelites were liberated out of Egypt and then the following Passover and the following Sukkot and this has only happened uh, three times in the last 500 years and this is going to be the fourth time it's going to happen in 2014 in 2015. And every time it happened, there's amazing events that took place in our world, around Israel, and around the people of God. And so that's why I say that I feel that Jesus could be coming back yes. real soon. Yes. 
Wow. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to just sharing that with you. Um, it's just, it's crazy stuff. Now, as we continue on with this thought though, since 1962, our country began to make some different decisions about God. And there seems to have been in the last 50 years of our country a purposeful drifting away or, or deciding to uh, just begin to eliminate God or to try to rewrite history, try to redefine uh, our values as a country and try to say that we are no longer a Christian nation, that God is no longer welcome in our schools, that God is no longer welcome, you know, the Word of God is no longer welcome on the hallways, on the, uh, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments of our schools or in our courts or wherever, you know, and the nativity scenes are no longer welcome in our city squares. And there's been all these decisions made. And so I just want to share with you, our foundation is in God, but recently we've made a drift. Here's some of the things. 1962, as you know, uh, the Supreme Court ruled 6-1 to one against New York's Regents Prayer. And that was the beginning of eliminating prayer out of our schools. This prayer was a non-denominational prayer created by the state education officials of New York for the children to recite in school. They did not have to recite this. It was a voluntary uh, opportunity for the children to recite this. It was not forced on anyone, but I want to read for you the prayer that our, our Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional. And you tell me if, if you uh, have a problem with your children praying this prayer in your school. Listen to this. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. That's it. That was the prayer. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence on thee, and we beg your blessings on us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. And so we decided to take that blessing, daily blessing, out of our schools. And so no longer were the students acknowledging a higher authority. No longer were they acknowledging you know, the absolute morality of God and His standards. No longer were they asking for God's blessing on their life or their parents or their schools, but not even on their country. Now, in 1963, the next year, the Supreme Court ruled 8 to 1 that devotional Bible reading in public schools is unconstitutional. I uh, just have just some statistics for you. I don't want to bore you with these. But since that time, 1962 and 63, there's a plethora of uh, statistics that have happened to our country since those decisions and we began to drift from God. Here's a couple of them. After 1963, pregnancies increased 187% in the next 15 years. Sexually transmitted diseases were up 226% in the next 12 years. Um, this chart here is that. You see, that is, I'm trying to see what's going on here. I can't tell you what that is. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Oh, that's the SAT scores. That's the SAT scores. You see that uh, vertical line there? That was uh, the SAT scores, and that vertical line is 1962. And when prayer and the blessing and the Bible is taken out of the schools, our SAT scores as a nation dropped dramatically and consistently for the next, I think, 10 or 15 years. And you see it was pretty consistent where it was. What's the next one? See that next slide. Sexually transmitted diseases. I don't, I don't, okay. Birth rates for unwed girls. Um, you see the, the vertical line there is 1963 and what took place uh, in that particular category. What's the next one? Divorce rates. Again, uh, 1960, uh, two and 63 is right here. Uh, and then, then we have violent crime. Again, you see where the line is and you see the, the, the statistics and the increase. The family, uh, before 1963, divorce rates had been declining for 15 years. After 1963, divorces increased 300% each year for the next 15 years. Okay? Uh, 1963 says unmarried people living together is up 353%. Single parent families are up 140%. Uh, violent crime is up 544%. So these are just some of the statistics 
I mean, some of the charts that you've seen. In the last 30 years, violent crime is up 560%. Crime is up 300%. Junior violent crime is up 300%. Child abuse is up 400%. Illegitimate births are up 500%. 85% of prisoners, 78% of high school dropouts, and 82% of pregnant teenagers, uh, the majority of drug and alcohol abusers, all come from single mother households. 85% of prisoners. Uh, the destruction of the family. 43% of American women will also uh, have an abortion in their lifetime. This took place in 1973 when we legalized abortion. So what happened in our country is be, as we begin to disinvite God and stop ask, asking for his blessing and his favor, uh, then he listen to us. <laughs> And the, the thing is with God is that He's, uh, you know, He will always be where He's invited. Now His purposes will always prevail and are marching forward. But God does not impose His will. He gave us something called free will. And our will, our will not, must be engaged. And if we want to live and we want to be filled with life, then we must believe that the way of God is the way of life. Amen. And we, by our own will, we must decide to return to the ways of God. As a people and as a country, if we want God's blessing and prosperity, if we want the smiles of heaven, we must wake up and we must see what we have done and we must just turn, repent, change, turn from our wicked ways. And there's a verse that I shared with you last week out of uh, Second Chronicles and it says, if my people, God is inviting us it says, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I will heal their land. So, um, with, with this phrase wicked ways. I think I mentioned this last week. I just want to make sure because it can come across as kind of really religious sounding and kind of mean. But, but as I've taught here recently, about six weeks ago, I taught about the way of the Lord. It's called halakha. The way of God is the way to life. And, and the word that we read in the Bible as righteous is the word that's used to describe a person who is just walking on the way of God. It's the person who's walking in the way of the Lord. That's righteous. And the word wicked is not like uh, a, a, a declaration that this person is, is worthless or evil or uh, bad, but it, it's a word that's described to the person who is not walking on the way of the Lord, and he's veered off and he is off the path. He's off the path. And that path, the Bible says, leads to death. The path of sin, the path of waywardness, the path of our own choices, our independence, our decisions to do what we want to do. And we, we don't trust God. We don't trust His ways are filled with life for us. And for some reason, we enter into this temporary insanity. And we think that we can find something better. Or the world offers us something better. Or there's something out there that I want that God's holding back on me from. And we're insane. Okay? But we buy into the lie. We buy into that lie. And we veer off the path. That's what the Bible describes as wicked. And the Bible says what we need to do is we need to turn back and get back out of the way of the Lord. We understand that. So, so this is not mean religious talk that I'm trying to give at all. But I am saying that we as a country need to turn. We need to turn back and get back on the way of the Lord. That is the path of life. And uh, there's a couple other things that I, I want to share that are going to get, a, a, I think, a little bit political, but it's not meant to be political. It's meant to be uh, a, a, a wake-up call to us to be the church, to be alive. We are to be distinct. When Jesus, or when, when God called his, his people out of Egypt, he said, you, there will be a distinction among you and the Egyptians. And I'm calling you out of to be mine, to be holy unto me, to be separated unto me. And so we have all been called out, out, to be brought into. We've been called out of darkness to be brought into the kingdom of light, that we would reflect to this world 
the light of God, the truth of God, the ways of God, that we would walk through the power of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment that he gives us. We would walk on the path of life and then we would be a light to the rest of the world, inviting them back. Come, yeah. come, yes. come, come from that way. That's not working. No, come from death to life. Come from brokenness to mendedness. You know, come from despair to hope. Come from darkness to light. And we are the kingdom of priests and we shout to the world. Come, come home, come to God. He loves you. He's here. He's for you. He will forgive you. Yeah. Turn, turn, come. Yeah. You see. And so as we do that, um, I don't know where I was going with all that. <laughs> I'm excited here. Uh, you know, as we as we do that, please see that the church, we are called. We are called to be distinct, to be holy, to be set apart. Not because we have to. But because God has called us and empowered us to experience something yes. called life. Yeah. Life. Yeah. Life to the full. Yeah. And when you start experiencing life to the full, you will look different than those who are dying. When you're alive, when you're full of peace and joy, when Christ is your all in all, and you're in this intimate relationship with God, you will look different than those around you. And you will do different. You will... Think different. And so that's the call of the church is to wake up and return to God. Trust in Him. Turn from our wicked ways and come home and, and embrace the life that God has for us. Not because we have to, but because it's filled with life. Life. So God is talking. This is so odd to me. God is talking not to uh, you know all the people who are lost. He's talking to His people. And he says, if my people will humble, that they will pray, that they will see, if they will turn, then I'm going to hear, I'm going to forgive them, and I'm going to heal the land that they live in. I'm going to heal their land. And their light will shine. And when light shines, darkness backs away. It gets swallowed up. Right? When the church just shines, our country will be different. In all the revivals of the world, Nobody went out to, to create all this great social change. Everybody just came to God. Yeah. And when people came to God, you know what happened? Yeah. Social change. Yeah. Everything started changing. Yeah. The virus started going out of business. Okay? You can look at the history of revivals. And great social change took place when people came to seek God. Yeah. So the church... I don't think we really need to just come up with a social agenda. Yeah. I think we need to seek God. Yeah. We need to do what God said. Humble ourselves. Pray and seek Him. Turn from our wicked ways. God will light a fire in us. He will cause us to shine so bright that it will, it will take care of itself. The rest of it will fall into place. His Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us. And things will change around us. And He will heal our land. And the people of God are the people of God. Just full of life in Him. And so, um, back in uh, 1789, when our country was started, they had a huge, huge debate. And uh, unfortunately, um, they decided not to take on the issue of slavery at the beginning of our country. They, they had a huge debate about this. And uh, they, were, they were in such a fragile state of trying to form our country that some of the key leaders... Uh, decided we just can't risk it because if we take this issue on right now, we might not be able to form this union. We might not be able to hold it together. And so, fortunately, our country was founded without addressing the issue of slavery. But it was brewing. And it was very unsettling to many people in our country from day one. And uh, you can see it in history. Uh, and, and so anyway, in 1863, we had a president that stood up and against all political wisdom and even against his own safety, uh, took this issue on head on and uh, from the conviction that God had given him that he must, he must do this. And it was time for our country to right this wrong. In 1863 was the Emancipation Proclamation by President Lincoln. And two years later, after our Civil War, in 1865, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution banning slavery was passed. And that was 
76 years. 76 years of a horrible, horrible time in our history of allowing that to take place. Not everybody wanted to take place. I'm not saying that at all. It was a great problem that we inherited. And through the cotton industry and so on, it became even more ingrained. But approximately 10 million Africans lost their lives in the slave trade between 1500 and 1800. 10 million. In our Civil War, we had approximately 620,000 people lose their lives to make that change. But aren't you glad that we have people that recognize the injustice of that policy and change that in our country? There are certain institutions in our world that are not redeemable. There are certain institutions that are evil to its core. Slavery is one of those. That is not something that you tweak and just try to work out and make everybody happy. That is something that you destroy because it's evil. There are certain institutions that are redeemable but are heading in the wrong direction. You hear what I'm saying? That we just need different policies. We need different changes. We need to line things up with God's ways. But when you look at slavery, that, that is not redeemable. And I thank God that we live in a country that stood up, paid the price to get rid of that evil policy in, in our history. Now, here's where I, I you know, need to step out a little bit and just ask for you to understand my heart because I care about our country and I care about people. And I want my country to be prosperous. Do you? Yes. And we have a great country and we are prosperous and God has blessed us and we have done amazing great things in our history. We have. But there's a few things that we're doing that I'm very concerned about that are not of God and we, we need to pray that God will change because it's, it's not good. It's evil. And one of those is abortion. Right. In 1973, January 22nd, we legalized, we legalized this as a nation. The problem is when a nation adopts a policy and legalizes it, that's a big deal in the eyes of God. You may have a nation that has not approved of something or legalized something, but it may be going on in parts. But when a country says, you know what, we're going to make this our policy, and we're going to adopt this, and this is what we're going to do, that's a, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. That's, a, that's not good for us. Now, I don't have a clue of the emotion that some of you are dealing with when that word is spoken. Because I know in this room that many of you have experienced this. And I, I do not want you to feel hurt at all by anything that I'm saying. Because I know that God, God loves each and every one of us. And who among us can stand without a long list of mistakes and sins and problems in the past. That has nothing to do with what I'm trying to say. And I pray God's healing for you. I pray that you will be released. If you have any guilt or shame, that you will be released from any of that. That you will not be tormented by that at all. Because that is not God's heart for you. It's not, not, not for you to live under that cloud at all. And I pray a release for you right now in the name of Jesus. That you will be released from that yes. and just set free yeah. from any oh, any God. of that if that's been a part of your life at all. You, because because the, <laughs> the statistics say that 43%, as I mentioned, 43% of women in America today will have experienced an abortion. Some of you, and some, some women are forced into it. Yeah. Uh, they're not given any support. They're given, you know, the, the opposite. And uh, there's a lot of different reasons why, why that, that happens. But I have to say to you, I have to say that it is an evil policy. It is killing our country and our future. And listen, I want to kind of just put this in juxtaposition, Pastor. I want to honor Pastor. One of the favorite words of all time, Pastor Bob's, is juxtaposition, right? I just want to put this in juxtaposition to slavery. We know how evil and hurtful and hard that was. And we're still paying the price of trying to catch up in our freedom in this country for our African Americans, right? We're still 
feeling that. Even in the 1960s, when Martin Luther King Jr. and so many other great civil rights leaders led us in, in a godly way to restore dignity to all human beings. I thank God for that movement. That was of God, and that's right. And we are still suffering from, from the years of abuse. But in, if you think about from 1500 to 1800, in those 300 years, there were 10 million African lives lost to the slave trade. 10 million. I want to share with you that this last year, just alone, there is over 1 million babies aborted in our country. Now I want to tell you some numbers because this is going to blow your mind away. Since 1973, January 22nd, last month, was the 40th year of this policy that had been passed in our country. 40 years. The oldest among us right now that have been aborted would be turning 40 years old this year. 40 years old. In the last 40 years, we have lost over 55 million Americans. If you don't know what that means, it means right now in this room, if I asked every sixth person to stand, it means one-sixth of what our current population should be in this country. One out of every six of us right here in this room are not here right now because of this policy. Does that start to sink in a little bit? And so 55 million and if you compare that to slavery, um, it just overpowers it. Now, the problem with the legalized abortion is that, of course, there are some ex extreme situations that we know of. People who uh, have experienced a pregnancy because of incest or rape, or perhaps during the pregnancy, there's a, a very serious health risk to either the mother or the baby. So these are some situations that, hey, I don't, you know, I'm not here to tell everybody how to live their life and what to do. But these are the issues that have created the policy in the first place. I just want to let you know that all of those issues together comprise approximately, including all the health risks that are used as reasons for abortions, approximately 7% of the abortions. 93% of the abortions have nothing to do with that. It has to do with these reasons. Not ready for responsibility. Too immature or young for a child. Parents don't want their daughter to have a child. Relationship problems. The person doesn't want to be a single parent. Has all the children she wants or they want. Their other children are grown and gone. Can't afford a baby. Concerned how the baby might change her life. Doesn't want anyone to know that she's pregnant. Those are all the reasons that comprise 93% of the reasons for these abortions, which this year is 1.1 million. 1.1 million. Out of convenience. Now, uh, President Obama made this comment on January 16th. He's fired up about guns. We all are. I mean, what happened here recently around Christmas time in our, one of our elementary schools is horrible. It stirs us all up, gets us all upset, and we all and don't ever want to see something like that happen again. And so he said this in response to some gun, gun policies that he was wanting to put into place. He said, in the month since 20 precious children and six brave adults were violently taken from us at Sandy Hook Elementary, more than 900 of our fellow Americans have reportedly died at the end of a gun. 900 in the past month, unquote. But over the same month that 900 Americans died because of a gunshot, over 100,000 babies in our country were aborted because of inconvenience. A hundred times the issue of guns. Now, my issue here, not trying to advocate for guns or anything like that, my issue is that in our country, we can get fired up about one thing while a great injustice and evil is legalized and just rolling along. Rolling along. This morning, already today in our country, I already looked this up and verified it, over 1,500 babies have been aborted 
already today. Today, this morning, already. 1,500. And I'm just saying to you that we as a country, we cannot give up the fight for injustice that's going on. When slavery was here, it took 76 years for our country to right that wrong and to get that out of here. I, I want to see the church of Jesus Christ fall in love with God and be so filled with his love that we shine and we are distinct and we're not participating in, in this policy and that through that move of God in our country that something like this will get switched around and eradicated because it's evil. It is killing our own people. And I don't speak about this because Pastor Bob and I, our, our hearts are to focus on love. So our hearts are not to focus on trying to pick a fight, trying to offend people. We don't, we're not interested in that. We're interested in loving people. We want to love God and we want to love, love one another. But this is an issue that, that God is just stirring in my heart that we need to be aware of. And we can't grow accustomed to it. We can't get relaxed with it. We can't just say, well, it's just the way it is. No, it's not the way it has to continue to be. These things can be changed. And uh, when the people of God just waken up and just fall in love with God and begin to really love this world, then things can change. I want to share with you that uh, there's a scripture in Proverbs 31, uh, verse 8 and 9. And I think it might be in your notes. And, and uh, this is what the, the, the passage says. It says to us to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute. To speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. And there is a cause that we have as the people of God. The cause is to love, is to defend, is to, is to pull down injustices. It is to step up all of our key leaders in our past who have made any changes at all. We're God-fearing Christians who are led by God, stirred by God, stirred by the injustices, stirred by something that needed to happen, and they were willing to lay their life down for that cause. They had the heart of God. God's heart breaks. Breaks when people are enslaved, when people are in oppression, when people are killed and murdered and hurt, when families are broken, when marriages are attacked, when kids are rebelling because they don't have that love or that structure that they need. And so I just, I don't know if this is stirring you at all. It has stirred me. I'm, I told you at the outset, I'm not real comfortable talking about this because I know my calling that God has in my life is to love. That, that's, that's without question what God has called me to do is to learn how to love Him, is to learn how to love people, and to, and to cause others to love people too, you know? And uh, I wanted to read as a close um, this passage that my dad had read this morning while we are praying, because I just think it's so fitting to where we are. And it says this, in, in Romans chapter 13, it says, and do the, no, i got to back up, Romans 13 verse 8. When you drive out this morning, I don't know if our snow pile is covering it up or not, but there's a rock out there. And on that rock, we have this quote, Romans 13 8. And it says, let no man, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And then he goes on to say, and do this, understanding the present time. Understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because your salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Goes on to say, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. I am stirred to pursue God and to seek Him and His kingdom and to do what He calls me to do as an American. 
in this community and in this country to shine the light, to wave a banner of love and truth that sets people free. People who are in darkness, the Bible says, are stumbling and don't even know what's causing them to stumble. But we bear a light, and our light does not bring a fight, doesn't bring an argument or frustration. Our light, our love, our truth, it brings freedom. It brings freedom. It brings freedom. And I just, I just pray, my prayer is that you heard my heart, that you're stirred, that we have a great country, but we have some issues going on that we need to be praying about, and we need to just allow God to touch us, touch our hearts, so that so that the rest will take care of itself. Amen. Shaddai is playing with all the children. He's, he loves on them, and he's doing all these different things. And he's he, he has this great city that he's created for. Him. But there's a wall that's built all the way around him, and it's made of stone. But in a section of the wall, there's a hole, and and it's open, and you know anyone could could take the choice to go out the hole and to go into the forest. And there's a little boy in the book that comes to Shaddai and says, you know. Why, why did you, why did you put that hole in the wall? And and he starts to explain to him because you know he he built the wall first of all because he loves us and he wants to protect us and he wants to keep us within the structure that he's built to, for us to help to to make the good choices and to live a good life. So he says. So the boy says, well then why did you put a hole in the wall? And he said, I put that hole in the wall because I want you to choose to be here. I want you to choose to live within my structure. Because if I if I didn't put a hole in the wall and I made you do this, then then it, it's not a choice. You don't choose to love me. It's something you have to do. And so he's like, I, I built that hole because I want you to choose to love me. So on into the story, the little boy goes over to the wall and he's looking at the hole and he's like, you know, it's out, it goes out into the forest and he's kind of peeking down in and he crawls a little bit in and he's looking a little bit more and he's like, you know, it doesn't look so bad out there. So he kind of crawls a little bit farther in. Eventually he gets out into the forest and he's like, wow, it's actually kind of nice out here, you know? So he goes for a walk and he it, it starts to get dark and things start to change a little bit. It's not as nice as what he thought it was. It's not as attractive. And he goes to go back to the wall and he gets back to the wall and he can't find the hole. The hole is now blocked. And, and now he becomes scared and he becomes a little nervous. He doesn't know what to do. He's wandering alone in the dark. And, and basically, what he said, God, God is on his way in the book to come find him because God already knows that he's out there. So God's on his way to come find him. And finally, he sits down and he thinks, I just need to, I just need to ask if God will come and find me. He's like, I know that he, he, he probably knows that I'm gone. So he sits down on the ground and he just says, God, if you, you can hear me, should I, should I is the name of the book, if you can hear me, please come and rescue me. I need your help. Yeah. And God comes yeah. and he rescues him. Yeah. I don't know where you are today. But if you've taken that path, You've gone out the hole because something has drawn you out that hole and now you're lost. If all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord and he will come and rescue you. 
Jesus said that he's the way. He's the way to the Father. And I just want to give you that opportunity right now just to call out to God. And if that's your heart this morning, you say, I, I just want to return. I just want to, I just want to return to God. I want to give my life to him. Would you lift your hand right now so I can agree with you as we just pray this prayer together. And uh, thank you for your hands. And let's, let's just write where you are. Thank you for your hand. Thank you. Right where you are, let's just let's just repeat this prayer to God and just let Him come and give us that peace and that forgiveness that we need and the strength that we need. And uh, so, would you just join me in this prayer and say, Father, thank you for loving me, and I call out to you right now, just like this boy in the story. Come and save me. I need you. I turn to you. I thank you for saving me right now. For forgiving me of all my sins. Of filling me with peace and confidence that you are with me. I offer myself to you because you love me and because you're good. And I trust in you with all of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. I also just want to pray a prayer for you this morning. Especially uh, just with the uh, emotion of some of the issues that I talked about today. Uh, I just want to pray a prayer uh, for all of us. Lord, we just come and I, I don't know all the answers. I don't even want to try to come up with those but God I know that we're here we are all broken people we are all here with things that we wish we hadn't done or things that we wish would have been different but God we know that you are the restorer of our soul you are the good shepherd you're the one who leads us beside the quiet waters you you lead us to the, the, the green pastures you restore our soul you restore our soul so, Lord, I pray for your presence to come right now and to just wash away any, anything in the past that has held us captive, anything in the past that has put a cloud over us. Lord, any, any regrets that uh, continue to eat at us, Lord, we release to you right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank that you are with us and you are for us and your forgiveness is more powerful than anything that we have ever done. And we can rest in your love. We can rest in your arms. And we thank you, Lord, that there's a new day and a new beginning in you. And that you've never given up on us. And your plans and purposes for our lives will prevail. Will prevail in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we come together as a people and we lift up this country to you, God. And our heart breaks for the things that we are doing that's contrary to you and your ways. Lord, we ask for forgiveness. We just ask for forgiveness on behalf of our country for some of the things that we have embraced and done. And Lord, we pray, we, we pray on behalf of our country that Lord, we would all turn, turn, turn to you and change and repent. Lord, that we would find life, we would find joy, we would find purpose, we would find hope in you. And Lord, for just a sweeping revival to take place across our country. Lord, that the people of God would come out of our slumber. That we would wake up and we'd see the glory of God. The beauty of God. The love of God. The power of God. We would experience your grace, oh God. That would set us free and fill us to overflowing. That our decisions would then mirror the work that you've done on the inside of our lives. And God, in this country, would be healed. That this country, once again, would, would declare boldly, one nation, 
under God. Under God. That we would declare our dependency upon you. That we would ask for your continued blessing upon us. And that we would continue to follow your leading. That we might be prosperous and successful in this world. That we might be able to love others. We might be able to extend your grace and your freedom and your forgiveness to others because of what you're doing in our lives. So Lord, we pray, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done right here in America. Lord, as it's ordained to be in heaven, we just dedicate our country to you today. We dedicate this community to you, Jesus. We dedicate the, the places that we live, the neighborhoods we represent, the communities that we live in. We de dedicate them to you, Jesus. They are yours. They belong to you. Jesus, you are Lord of my troubles. You are Lord of this area. You're Lord. You're Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Why don't we stand and uh, I want to close us with a blessing. And if you have time, I'm sure the worship team would, would love to have you just join them in a final song. But if you need to get going, uh, that'd be fine too. Come on. You got it. That's on. Okay. I would uh, think it would be wonderful if we could get Tim and Amy and uh, Gene Shaw and Art Wyman to come up here. All four of them are going to Israel for 10 days. And I thought we had a trip to Michigan. So where Art is and Gene, come on up here. I am so excited for them. Uh, Linda and I are both able to go to Israel. And I myself had three personal encounters with God there. And they're, they're, they're going uh, as a mission. And we're going to commission them on this mission that they're going on. And uh, so let us uh, just put your hands up to them. And Father, what an awesome thing that uh, Art and Jean and Tim and Amy are able to go to Israel. God, we pray your angels have charge over them, to protect them, to watch over them every step of the way. And Lord, for them special moments that they're going to have with you. God, let their eyes be enlightened as their heart is also enlightened. And have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to them there, Lord. And Father, that they bring back. For Father, we do desire you. We desire more of you. We desire revival. We do, Lord. I pray today that we had ears, really, to hear what you were saying to us. Lord, that we would awaken and come out of slumber. And Lord, thank you for these four that get to go. And Father, be touched up by you in a mighty, personal way. Father, with them and for all of them that are all going, we pray the same protection. And Father, for that same touch by you, that they will be changed from faith to faith and from glory to glory. God, thank you for your presence here today so strong. Now, now we, may we rise up and be doers of the living word of God, that you would be glorified. In the mighty name of Jesus, and we all said, Amen. 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 Let me bless you as you go, and then our, our worship team will do a final song. And uh, I want to bless you the same way I blessed Juliet earlier, okay, with the priestly blessing. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.